recording. So just to give you a, a quick overview of what we're going to do today, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end. I know we have 15 minutes um, put aside, but there'll be likely more. So um, if you're just happy to either put the messages in chat, you can you can put any questions towards me and I can put them, at, uh, I can ask them at the end. Um, some people are self-conscious about asking them directly. So if you want to go through me, that's fine. Um, and there'll be plenty of opportunity yourselves uh, at the end as well. So I'm going to give a, a brief overview of, of, of LightSource. Uh, we're the energy pilot for CyberSane, who we are very briefly. And then Jorge will give an overview, uh, welcome an overview on, on the CyberSane project. Then we'll go into the, the CyberSane platform architecture. Um, Filippo then will describe the energy pilot and bring us through some uh, solar energy management pilot executions. So. At the very start, I'm just going to share my screen and then ask panicked if, if everyone can see my screen. So uh, just bear with me. Can people see that? Yes. OK, great. So LightSource, uh, LightSource Labs, we were founded in 2016 um, under LightSource BP's. Uh, opportunity in smart and connected digital industry. So Lightsource Labs, we're an Irish company based in Limerick on the west coast of Ireland. Uh, we're 100% owned by Lightsource BP and Lightsource BP is 50% uh, owned by BP British Petroleum as some of the energy companies diversify into the renewables that they could see potential in Lightsource Labs. So we are a team of 10 to 12 um, software hardware engineers um, based in Limerick. Um, and we, we specialize in cutting edge IoT. So overall, then in the labs worldwide, there's 30 engineers and developers and we have staff, mainly salespeople in, in Spain, Athens and Australia. But we, we also have a team in London. And as I said, the, the Irish team uh, based here in, in Limerick. So we're involved in a lot of European and national R&D uh, programs as well. Just to give you a very brief overview on the technology, this is the, the tribe unit is inside in the orange box there. The actual third generation latest Gen 3 tribe box, it's designed, manufactured and, and produced in Ireland. So that's that's something we're quite proud of uh, and the Irish team is quite proud of. So it sits in a home, it's it's an energy management system and um, it, it has applications in residential and commercial. And uh, what it does is it, it, it works between your solar PV and um, battery storage, uh, hybrid inverter um, and your, your applications in the house. And what it will do is it will optimize um, data, it will optimize electricity flow within the house. So for places like Ireland and the UK where feed in tariffs are quite small, it will optimize the energy flow in the home. So it will put the least amount back as possible. Um, to feed in tariffs and then in places like Australia and Spain where there's generous feed in tariffs or dynamic tariffs, um, it can be set to export or import uh, as you wish. Um, and it's as hands off as you want. Uh, if you're not somebody who's who's interested in that, but you just want to have cost savings in the home, um, it'll work in the background. It pulls in uh, meteorological forecasting, um, dynamic tariffs, uh, regular tariffs. Um, it learns your consumption habits and, and it works it to optimize that. But on the right hand side, there is the app and through the app, you can go in and you can set priorities. Um, you can set it to come on and off as you wish um, and you can have a look at the savings. And, and over the last couple of months, we've actually we've gotten rid of our subscription free for, for the app. So um, just to, to open the market even further for ourselves and um, also as a commercial aspect. So things like fleet management um, across devices or across a, an estate, we'll say, or an area or district. So you can instruct um, a fleet of tribe units to, to charge batteries if if we'll say at night time where renewables are high and consumption is low or during times of peak grid demand you can get you know x amount of homes to discharge x amount of kilowatt hours and what we call peak shaving so we've been involved in some projects in ireland and um the uk on frequency response as well um, so this is all possible. Um, some of the commercial aspects that we've been asked to, to present on things like hotels and restaurants where you can deploy multiple tribe units across the property. Um, and you can also integrate it with your building management system as well for things like, um, you know, servicing, repairs, uh, yeah, predictive maintenance and optimization. 
Um, and then that's it. Really, the Irish office were, were involved in quite a number of national and European funding projects. Uh, this this just some of them. Um, and we have staff that that have been involved in, you know, Fra Framework Programme 7 projects through Horizon 2020. Uh, and we're just currently putting together some pro some proposals for Horizon Europe. So um, that that's it in a nutshell. I'm going to hand over to Jorge now to just give an introduction into the CyberSend project and an overview of, of what we're trying to achieve within the project. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So I will proceed from here. And thank you all for attending this meeting of the second pilot of the project CyberSign. So I believe you are watching my screen now. Um, regarding the, the session that we are now starting, I will go very fast through the agenda and uh, I will present the consortium and the partners. Also, I will do a very quick overview of the project and then I will go through a view of the status of the, um, of the project. So this is uh, our agenda. We are starting now with the CyberSign overview. Uh, actually, we started at 9.30. There is a, um, a small error here with the timetable. And uh, then we will have the training session after this. And the following, we will have the execution of the um, pilot. Regarding the consortium, um, we um, have a project that runs from 2019 to until this year, August 2022. So it's a 36 month project. Uh, there are 16 partners from all over Europe um, working together to advance this project. Also, we have three end users from the areas of port, health and energy that are going to test our system precisely in the pilots that we are now executing. This is just um, a brief overview of the work package leaders. So we have 11 areas of work. This is so these are the leaders of each of those areas. So it's very diverse and uh, we all have to work together to reach the desired results. Regarding the project overview, we will have a bird's view, which is a high level approach of the project. Um, in short, the CyberSense system wishes to implement all the phases of the cyber incident handling life cycle from the preparatory activities to handling the incidents to detect them to do some forensics and analysis and also to aid in the recovery and the knowledge harvesting after the incident has taken place. Uh, this system also aims to increase the agility of the investigators that are analyzing the cyber incidents. So we rely on existing systems and tools. We have worked on them to evolve them even more. And we have security sensors, components of web mining, uh, intelligence solutions. Uh, we have um, event management approaches. So it's a group of components that we have working together and they constitute the richness and the advantage of CyberSign. We also have a modular approach so that in the future we may integrate with other models into our system. Uh, we use techniques for prevention, detection, and mitigation of cyber threats. Um, and the, the CyberSign is composed by several main components. So we have LiveNet for monitoring the traffic on a network. We have DarkNet to scan and monitor the dark web. We have hybrid net for data mining and analysis. And then we have share net to share information about cyber incidents. And that information is anonymized and um, through privacy net so that it can be shared without revealing internal details of the institutions where the incidents first are detected. Um, so going a bit more 
into detail of the components. Uh, we have LiveNet to monitor, analyze, and visualize the organization's network in real time. Then we have DarkNet to monitor the dark and the deep web. We have HybridNet, as I said before, that receives the information from LiveNet and from DarkNet, and then proceeds to analyze and evaluate the threat uh, to the organization. And then we have ShareNet, which is a component that disseminates and shares the information of the incidents with other relevant parties that are configured to receive this kind of information. And then PrivacyNet is the component that, that provides the privacy anonymization and the obfuscation and also the, cap the capabilities of data protection, orchestration and consistency of the data to be shared. So these are the five components that comprise CyberSign. Regarding the structure of the project, uh, at the beginning we had um, the requirements uh, and scenarios phase in the work package two. Um, they were defined there. After that, we proceed to the analysis, the specification, and the implementation of the five components that constitute CyberSign from work package three to work package seven. And now we are in the phase of the pilots. So before the pilots, we have been working in the integration and deployment of the CyberSign system uh, by aggregating all the components that was done in work package eight. And now we are executing the pilots that we have been preparing since the beginning of work package nine. And on work package 10, we will evaluate and define the best practices for CyberSign after getting the lessons learned from the pilots. And finally, uh, we have work package 11, which focuses on the dissemination, the exploitation, and the market approach after we finish the project. This is where we have our communication activities, and this is also where we will address the market with the CyberSign system when it's ready uh, to be go to market. So regarding the work plan, our project has been running for two and a half years. So in year one, we launched CyberSign. We defined the objectives, requirements, the architecture, and we started the plan for dissemination and for communication. In the second year, our focus was on developing the components. And at the end, we started working on the full integration and the preparation of the pilots. Right now, we are in the third year of the project and we are actively executing the pilots and validating their results. And from them, we will evaluate the capabilities, the correctness and the coverage of CyberSign. So we will take our lessons from what needs to be evolved and uh, we will make the system ready for the market. Uh, the pilot focus on three business sectors, which are transport, the port, energy and healthcare. So today we are executing the second pilot precisely in the energy sector. So this is the end of my small presentation regarding the project. So I'm going back to the agenda. And um, next we will start the platform training session uh, with my colleague. Dennis, are you ready to proceed? Good morning, everybody. Morning. Uh, welcome to the second uh, pilot of uh, CyberSane project. Um, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, I guess now you are able to see my screen. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Um, so, hey, I'm Thanos Karadzias. Um, I represent Mangioli in the CyberSane project. 
uh, and uh, we undertake um, the responsibility of uh, leading and contributing in several tasks uh, within uh, the project, most of them are technical, as you can understand, and at the same time as uh, technical coordinators, uh, we support and assist uh, the project coordinator uh, for ensuring uh, the correct performance of the project and technical tasks. So um, uh, I have two different sessions in my uh, in my presentation, uh, two slides only to go through the components already introduced by George. Uh, and uh, a slide for the system architecture, and then we will go to a live presentation uh, viewing all the different functionalities uh, we have uh, implemented uh, in CyberSAIN system, uh, and then we will proceed with the actual uh, performance of the scenarios uh, for the light source labs. Uh, so, um, uh, the vision of the CyberSAIN system is actually, as George said, to be an innovative and knowledge-based collaborative security and response dynamic system. So our main intention in the project is, first of all, to implement all phases of the cyber incident handling life cycle, and on the other hand, to increase the agility of security professionals and experts to encourage continuous learning. Um, uh, it's what we call as a meta tool, uh, which builds uh, on existing tools, we will see later on, uh, and provide and builds uh, more advanced uh, security services. So, uh, the CyberSAIN core, among others, consists of uh, five very critical uh, CyberSAIN components. The first of uh, the first is the LiveNet component, uh, which is uh, the component that actually uh, takes the responsibility to prevent and detect threats, uh, providing to security professional insights and the track record of the activities within their information technology environment. Um, the DarkNet uh, allows the exploitation and analysis of security risks and threats related to information from the deep and dark web. And uh, this is realized via analysis of both the textual and the metadata content available from uh, various uh, electronic streams. Um, the next component is the Hibernate one. Uh, the Hibernate uh, is expected to provide the intelligence needed to perform effective and efficient analysis of security events. And um, this actually can be achieved uh, with uh, two different ways. Uh, on one hand, on information uh, produced and extracted from itself, and on the other, from information and data derived and acquired from uh, other uh, cyber-chain components, such as LiveNet, DarkNet, and so on. Uh, the CERNet component uh, provides the necessary threat intelligence and information sharing capabilities of the critical infrastructure with uh, external uh, to the organization parties. Um, so, um, can be used as a secure and privacy-oriented storage uh, as soon as the data is received in the central core uh, platform uh, and uh, with the um, um, uh, co collaboration with PrivacyNet, it creates all the policies required for the sharing, uh, for, for sharing the content. Uh, privacy, uh, privacy net uh, is, uh, as I said before, is very well connected with CERNET and um, is being responsible for managing and orchestrating the application of the required privacy mechanisms, maximizing um, achievable levels, levels of confidentiality and data protection. So, uh, based on these components, uh, we, um, we, we will have a quick view of the system architecture. So, at this slide, first of all, we would like to, to introduce the different uh, user types we have recognized in the CyberSAIN platform. And these are uh, the security expert, the CyberSAIN admin, uh, and of course, uh, all vendors and suppliers that uh, provide tools uh, within the CyberSAIN context. Um, the CyberSAIN architecture implements several architectural layers. 
taking into account that uh, we recognize the layer in which the cyber saying apps uh, exist. Uh, the core um, uh, system building blocks, which is actually the heart of our system, the cyber saying ecosystem uh, in which all tools of the project partners brings on the table reside. Uh, and of course, uh, any other third party application uh, and system that is required to be properly integrated either now or in, in the near future with our main platform. Uh, so uh, the cyber saying uh, application layer um, consists of course of the main dashboard. It is the dashboard and the application that the system implements in order to allow all different user types to directly interact uh, with the cyber same platform and services. Uh, the uh, core system building block, uh, you can see that in the heart of it, uh, there is what we said, the cyber same services. Uh, we built it to implement uh, all the business logic uh, required by any module uh, and define and provide The, um, an orchestration and API, uh, which is a single point of entry for all connection for the business logic to be provided, and the policy enforcement and generic and horizontal layer, uh, which allow us to apply any policy is required to be enforced when providing the different cyber same uh, services. Uh, on the top, uh, as an abstract layer, uh, we implement uh, an identity management module uh, which uh, enables on one hand end user to be able to administer and control their identities and of course any other tool and system within the cyber chain ecosystem or even outside of it to harmonize their authentication and authorization procedures. Um, uh, going uh, uh, next to the next module, uh, we can see the adapter. Uh, it actually acts as an API management uh, and is used uh, for distributing and controlling and analyzing the different APIs uh, that allows uh, our core platform to connect with the, var uh, with the various cyber chain application. And at the cyber chain ecosystem, as you can see, we have a list of tools uh, from uh, different partners uh, that participate in the project and this tool provide a significant set of services and features for each one of the main CyberSense components. As I said before, the LiveNet, the DarkNet, the HybridNet, the CERNet and the PrivacyNet. Um, CyberSense platform actually uh, um, does not uh, the purpose of the cyber same platform is not to uh, uh, reproduce all these different um, and regenerate all the different set of functions provided from this list of uh, of tools. So uh, as I said before, actually uh, we um, uh, we utilize all the different set of uh, functionalities and services provided from these tools and we build upon in order to provide a decision making tool for all security professional uh, and security expert within an organization. Um, so, of course, all these tools uh, come with their built in dashboards uh, and uh, the security expert and the security professional uh, may visit uh, each one of the individual uh, building dashboards of, the, of, of these tools in order to gain more and uh, in-depth information about uh, the context that uh, each tool brings uh, in the CyberSane uh, platform. Uh, and uh, for achieving uh, this difficult integration because now as you can see we have 13 tools but in the near future and the model we have adapted uh, allow us to integrate easily with any other tool uh, on this um, cyber chain ecosystem uh, we have the message queuing mechanism 
uh, which allow us to provide an asynchronous communication protocol, putting messages uh, onto a message queue and not require an immediate response to continue processing. Because as you can understand, uh, we implement many, many different services uh, and many of these services may depend one another. Um, uh, so, of course, we have uh, the data storage uh, with uh, either relational database uh, or uh, non-relational database. Um, and uh, we uh, provide, of course, uh, a set of uh, infrastructure and support services for logging, auditing, uh, monitoring and analyze all the different events within the CyberSAN uh, system. Uh, and um, in order to properly integrate all these different layers, we have an application gateway that uh, um, uh, is in between of the CyberSAN apps and the core system. And pro pro uh, possibly in the future, we will uh, utilize a VPN gateway for each one of these tools to be more securely connected uh, with the core system. Um, last but not least, uh, any third uh, um, party and application uh, can be uh, easily also integrated, provide more advanced services and currently at this uh, analytics and monitoring uh, subcomponent, um, we, um, uh, we are integrated with um, Google Analytics and so on. Uh, that's all for uh, a, it, it was a brief overview of the system architecture, but uh, let us uh, proceed to the next um, session uh, and go to the real platform and see uh, how we deal with all these uh, different uh, CyberSAN components and the services that they provide and how these are realized for the, uh, for the security professional and uh, the security expert. I guess you're continuing to see uh, my screen, but now uh, the actual uh, the, the actual platform. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so uh, when uh, we concluded on the system architecture of the platform, uh, the next step uh, was to define all these uh, component services and find a way to proper utilize them and provide uh, concrete uh, user journeys for, uh, for our different end users. So in the context of the project, we decided uh, to be based on best practices and build these usage flows upon uh, worldwide accepted recommendation and guides. To this end, we finally adopted the NIST Computer Security Incident Handling Guide. According to this guide, the organization of an effective computer security incident response capability involves several major decisions and actions. And these decisions and actions are properly uh, grouped in four different phases. Uh, so we have uh, the preparation phase. Uh, this is the initial phase which involves the establishment and training of all uh, involved incident response teams, acquiring the necessary tools and resources. During the preparation phase, the organization attempts to limit the number of incidents that will pro possibly occur. Uh, and this, uh, is, this is achieved by selecting and implementing a set of controls based on the results of, the, of risk assessments. Uh, as a second phase, uh, we identify, based on this guide again, the detection and analysis phase uh, in which um, is needed because we know that uh, residual risk uh, identified in the preparation phase will persist even if after uh, controls are implemented. So. Uh, detection of security bridges is necessary to alert the organization whenever incidents occur. Obviously, this is the core phase in which CyberSAN uh, easily contributes 
And as you will see later on, all the different scenarios uh, that we uh, prepared uh, for the two-day uh, pilot session uh, are based on this detection and analysis phase. Uh, the containment, eradication and recovery phase uh, is the one that um, allow us uh, to uh, analyze uh, all the evidences uh, gathered from the detection and analysis phase. So at this phase, uh, the CyberSync project can only contribute on the containment, the gathering of evidence, as I said before, uh, since we don't have any tool currently or mechanism for eradicating and recovering the organization from specific attacks. So we will see later on in which depth we cover this phase. And uh, the post, at the post-incident activity, uh, this phase actually takes after uh, takes place after the incident is properly is properly handled. Uh, the organization so um, uh, is capable at this phase to uh, build any lesson learned gained uh, in this overall incident handling process uh, and uh, share this lesson learned with uh, outside the organization entities, either missed instances or specific organization contacts. Uh, so uh, taking one by one uh, the, the different the functionalities and the services provided uh, at these phases, I will uh, take the opportunity to uh, introduce also our main dashboard. Uh, so at this dashboard, the security professional and the security expert is capable of having an operational overview of what is going on on the organization in terms of uh, incidents, attack patterns and anomalies identified in a timeline, um, all different uh, contacts and users uh, register and if these um, uh, their contact information, speaking of their email address, is uh, uh, has any uh, breach uh, uh, on the deep and dark, on the deep and dark web. Uh, all uh, the list of uh, inventories registered for the specific organization. Uh, all the vendors and vulnerabilities that our platform uh, automatically identifies repositories. I will explain later on. All the threads already identified within the organization and the attack scenarios, possible attack scenarios, uh, which are actually the combination of identified vulnerabilities with threads in for every individual asset, uh, and uh, some uh, overview of the latest risk assessment performed uh, within the organization. So, I will start with the preparation phase. And at this preparation phase, uh, as we said before, um, uh, in order to handle incident, uh, we uh, refer to a list of tools and resources available that may be of value during the incident handling. So we start with the communications. Uh, at these uh, two sections, the security administrator of uh, the organization is able to register any uh, individual uh, internal the organization contact that uh, will probably later on uh, uh, be configured in order to, to receive automatic alerts for every incident attack pattern or anomaly identified or external the organization entities. Uh, the most important, one of the most important uh, I, uh, services that we provide at the preparation phase is actually the asset inventory of the organization. Uh, at this section, uh, the um, uh, security professional and the security administrator of the organization is able to register one by one all within the organization uh, that need to be properly handled in an incident process handling uh, in an incident handling process uh, process. So uh, for the specific organization, 
we already register uh, 25 individual assets, uh, each one with their um, uh, very specific detail uh, description, and the interrelationship of, uh, of this asset with other organizational assets. This, has, this allow us to have a quick overview of what is going on within this organization. So we can see that we have several uh, assets uh, and uh, they are in relation with other assets within the organization. Upon registering each one of the assets with the proper way, and what we mean with the proper way, our systems automatically provide a mechanism uh, that help the security professional to be very concrete when registering a new asset. So, uh, assuming that I want to register a new SQL server, uh, I select uh, the proper vendor. The system automatically brings me all the list of available products for this vendor. So, I will uh, select an SQL server. And the system again brings me automatically all the different versions of this uh, product. So I can select, for example, uh, this um, uh, version. Uh, and upon saving, I can come here and see automatically what are the existing and known vulnerabilities of this asset based uh, on uh, open vulnerability management repositories. Currently, we integrate with the NIST vulnerability ma uh, management uh, database. Uh, so we bring, um, periodically we update our, our uh, local repository uh, of vulnerabilities from this open repository. And upon selecting the proper um, a common platform enumeration, as we said, the, the combination of vendor, product, and version, the, the system brings automatically uh, the current vulnerabilities, the known vulnerabilities for this asset. Uh, of course, at this section, we can also create any new control uh, that it's been applied for mitigating existing vulnerability or threats. Uh, if we uh, register one or more controls, we have the opportunity later on, later on when performing the risk assessment to exclude all the vulnerabilities and threats that are related with these controls. Uh, and at the threat intelligence uh, section, we can see the full list of vulnerabilities, as I said, uh, coming from um, uh, the NIST repository, and I can also see the very uh, concrete details uh, and the description for each one of these vulnerabilities. And here I'm able to register all the different uh, threads uh, that I have identified within the organization. The thread is related with an attack type in our platform. Uh, in the cybersecurity domain, there are a lot of enumeration of attacks. Uh, in uh, cyber same context, we uh, append and we are based on the CAPEC Mitre um, um, uh, list and, uh, and classification of attacks. So, uh, CAPEC Mitre is a comprehensive dictionary and classification taxonomy of known attacks that can be used by analysts, developers, uh, or testers, or whatever, community, uh, and we have adopted the metric classification for two different reasons. First of all, uh, it is considered as a de facto among researchers, and secondly, it's automatically associated with CVE-based vulnerabilities. So the second issue is extremely crucial because it automates uh, many, diffic many difficult tasks when I uh, want to perform a, a specific risk assessment. So, uh, currently, uh, for uh, the light source labs, we have already identified more than 120 
threads. Upon clicking in each one of the thread, I can uh, view also the very detailed description as this description comes uh, from the CAPEC meter repository. So uh, we enable the security professional to be uh, very, um, very uh, in a very good level aware uh, of all the uh, security uh, threats uh, within the organization. So at the attack scenarios, what uh, and uh, we allow the security professional to build possible attacks. How we, uh, we can do that? By combining threats, specific threats, with specific vulnerabilities, and this to be associated with, with one or more specific organizational assets. Upon uh, performing uh, this uh, task, and as you can see here, we have more than uh, uh, 460 attack scenarios already identified. We can come uh, at uh, the prevention um, state and perform uh, a secure a, a, a risk assessment. Uh, based on the latest risk assessment, we can see now the same uh, visualization uh, of the asset inventory, but now we can have also the risk level uh, of uh, all these different uh, assets. So uh, upon clicking on uh, each one of these, I can see also the very detailed footprint about these assets. I can see that the vulnerability impact in relation with the threat probability gives me an interactive heat, heat map with uh, results based on the latest risk assessment. And I can see the very uh, the details of each one of these levels. So I can see that for the threat buffer overflow via environmental uh, variables in association with this specific vulnerability um, score. Um, of course, for the risk assessment, we can uh, have the execution summary, different uh, graphs that analyze uh, this, um, uh, uh, this process. Uh, all these different graphs are interactive in order to give more detailed information to the security professional and the security expert in order to properly take decisions. Uh, of course, we, we have the risk analysis uh, and we can see that at the very high level we have all these different assets and upon clicking in each one of these assets I can see the very concrete and specific thread in, uh, and vulnerability that builds this risk for this asset. Uh, and uh, of course we have also different levels of analysis based now on the asset perspective in which we I can have the different threads with the different vulnerabilities. So all these are um, at the preparation phase uh, in which uh, we, 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 we haven't handled and managed any of the real-time monitoring uh, events that we have identified. So, uh, in, uh, concluding with the preparation phase, I will uh, pass to the detection and analysis phase. Uh, at the detection and analysis phase, as, as said before, this is the core phase in which the cyber saying easily contributes based on the context and the concept of the list of tools uh, that are already integrated. And uh, at this specific uh, phase, uh, we can um, uh, recognize that for many organizations, the most challenging part of the incident response process is accurately 
detect and assess possible incidents. So this requires to determine whether an incident has occurred and if so, the type, recognize the type, the extent and the magnitude of the problem. So um, uh, first of all, we are register registering security incidents. So as you can see here, all the different integrated tools uh, feed automatically list of security incidents and uh, the system automatically also analyze in a timeline view and uh, based on their severity all these different security incidents and the same happens for the attack patterns with their analysis and the anomalies with their analysis. So automatically uh, the security uh, professional uh, can, uh, uh, based on the utilization of the cyber scene dashboard and only, uh, can be aware of all the different uh, security incidents, attack patterns and anomalies identified from agents that are already deployed within the inventory of the organization. Uh, based on this, the security professional can come at the alerts and notification phase and uh, create as many different alert and notification configurations as preferred. For example, uh, I can have a test uh, uh, configuration with a description and I can say that all the medium high and critical in severity security incidents uh, in accordance with high uh, severity anomalies and high and critical uh, attack patterns, uh, I, I want the system to automatically uh, inform this and this uh, organizational user or this and this internal the organization contracts already identified at the preparation phase. And I want to say I am also capable of, uh, of selecting if uh, the alert that uh, it will be sent automatically by email, it will have the detail um, a description of the security incidents, uh, incident an anomaly or attack pattern, or it will, it will have just an overview. So upon creating these different uh, configurations, the system respects and applies all these rules. Uh, so whenever uh, automatically the system is being fed from a security incident, for, uh, for example, uh, the system will generate automatic alerts uh, to the proper contacts within the organization. Um, upon discovering now security incidents, attack patterns or anomalies, the security professional is also able to visit the deep web uh, threat intelligence section in order to, first of all, to see if the organization name is being discussed within the dark web. We can see that we have a zero result here, so we are uh, uh, we are pretty sure that LightSource Labs is not being uh, uh, discussed uh, in the deep and dark web currently. But we, are, we also uh, perform another um, um, search within the deep and dark web. We see that the domain that the LightSource Labs, um, uh, uh, the, domain, the domain of, of the organization uh, if we have any article and, and discussion uh, for this uh, description. So we can see that uh, we have a lot of articles discussing for, uh, uh, for the energy domain. And we can see also the total documents uh, that we have currently processed uh, within the deep and dark web. One step further, I can uh, go uh, at uh, and search for a specific article. For example, 
choosing the category cyber attacks, I want to see if there's any discussion or article regarding malware, and I want to uh, see to set a, a specific duration uh, for uh, for my search. So uh, I I can see that indeed with these keywords at this category and at the latest month, we can see several articles here and discussions uh, from deep and dark web. And of course, I can visit the actual um, the actual uh, article. Uh, I can also uh, see all the different keywords for this article used, uh, the score of uh, of my research, and all the list of specific sources that have published this article. Uh, of course, we uh, perform several uh, other anal analysis based on the uh, cyber uh, concept in text, uh, the cyber concept uh, in relation with their critical score, um, uh, the um, URLs and the sources that have published specific, um, um, specific articles with known keywords, um, number of crowd URLs per date. Uh, so with this, in this way and with this analysis, we allow the security expert to have a full view, probably initiated from a security uh, incident identified in, in his organization. Um, with this, uh, one step further, we can also allow the security professional to search the open web uh, for, for uh, similar articles. So if again, I'm, I will choose malware as a concept, and set again a duration of the latest month. I can see that probably the system will bring will bring me a number of articles uh, that has uh, have been already also published uh, at the open web and have a view of these articles. So upon making and enabling the security uh, professional to uh, perform his investigation, he can come at the next phase and set a proper organizational strategy for eradicating and mitigating from all the different uh, uh, evidences from the detection and analysis phase. So at this section, the security professional can say that I would like to, to initiate a new uh, strategy, to set a new strategy that it will be published across the organization. And I need to do for the recovering and, uh, and eradication phase, step one, this, and step two, this, in order to uh, for this strategy to be uh, properly ap applied. And this asset, is uh, related with one or more specific assets in my organization. Uh, also, is being related with one or more specific security incidents identified at the detection and analysis phase. And click save. So I have a library with all the different strategies within the organization so all the different users of this dashboard may uh, follow uh, and be aware of the specific strategies, eradication and recovery strategies set from the security team. We have also implemented another uh, interesting uh, um, uh, environment within the CyberSane platform, which is the simulation environment. And in this, we enable the security professional to perform specific 
um, specific, uh, what to build specific what if scenarios. At this phase, um, what I'm, uh, I'm building is assuming that I have an attacker with a high uh, skill profile and uh, starting from um, my MQTT broker, uh, I want to check if he will eventually reach the Aurora database. So this engine uh, automatically computes all the different attack paths within the organization uh, in order for me to better analyze uh, the probability of occurrence of a specific uh, attack path. As you can understand, I'm setting uh, an execution time because if you have a huge list of assets, then the probable attack scenarios may be of hundreds or of thousands. So with green, I can see that all these attack paths are succeeded. With these attack paths, the, uh, the attacker eventually starting from our MQTT broker uh, uh, reached uh, my target uh, asset. And let us see the analysis of this uh, attack path. So th what the algorithm says here is the attacker will start from M MQTT broker. I can click on, on this asset. I can see the uh, which uh, vulnerability was, uh, will exploit first. And this is uh, the description of the vulnerability. And I can see also, bring me all identified security incidents, anomalies, or attack patterns identified for this asset in order to, to be able to, to confirm that, okay, the exploitation of this vulnerability is probable because I have already the security incident and I have already uh, these anomalies for this asset. So again, we strengthen uh, the decision-making process of the security professional within the organization. Uh, so starting from the MQTT broker, uh, the uh, the security the, the attacker will be able to to go to the next uh, interconnected asset which is the ubworks broker core uh, and at this uh, he will eventually uh, exploit this vulnerability and go on with the broker restful api service and then from the api service he will eventually reach the Aurora database exploiting very specific vulnerabilities at each one of these assets. So based on this, probably uh, the security professional is able to come back to the preparation phase and decide why not to set and build and implement a new control in order to eliminate and mitigate specific vulnerabilities. So this is the containment and eradication phase. Uh, um, as I said before, we are not currently uh, able to provide uh, uh, tools and functionalities for actually eradicate and, uh, and contain uh, and uh, recover from uh, uh, specific incidents. Uh, and we come at the latest phase, which is the post-incident activity uh, uh, phase. And the first uh, set of actions here uh, that I, uh, our security professional is able to, to follow is, first of all, to create lesson learns. So when gaining the knowledge from the preparation, mostly the detection and analysis phase and the eradication and recovery process, I can come here and say, okay, for whatever type of attack I have identified, I want to build a new lesson learned 
to build my internal organization library in order for this library to be uh, for this document to be visible uh, across the organization and upon creating a new lesson learned I'm also able to share it with uh, external the organization parties either partners of of, uh, of me or misp instances um, with um, uh, security incidents, uh, knowledge databases, and so on. Uh, uh, in order to properly share this lesson learn, of course, I need to uh, build uh, a specific data sharement, data sharing agreements, so I can. Uh, pre-configure all the different external the organizational parties that I want to share things from the CyberSAIN platform. So I'm able to be to build one or more data sharing agreements and uh, all these agreements become available in order to share the actual document. But before doing this, when registering uh, these data sharing agreements, I probably want to enforce a very specific privacy policy in this sharing process because when I will I, uh, I will be I will build this lesson learned, I will for sure um, specify some assets of my inventory. But for these assets, I don't want my internal IP to be shared with external the organizational parties. So I may have specific policy and privacy requirements when sharing uh, these uh, uh, assets, information, uh, security incidents, information anomalies. For example, at this security incident, I don't want the source IP or the destination IP of these incidents to be uh, shared with this lesson learned. So when uh, uh, creating the data sharing agreements, I'm able to specifically uh, set uh, all the attributes that, that need to be excluded or anonymized or whatever needs to be or encrypted, uh, uh, all the different um, uh, mechanisms that, uh, that actually build a specific privacy policy and needs to be applied at this sharing process. Of course, and this is the end of my uh, session, uh, we have uh, the uh, organizational uh, and the user and the organizational uh, services. Uh, with the, uh, uh, following this, I can see that I'm able to, because I'm a super user, I can uh, visit whatever organization uh, I prefer. And at this section, I'm able to see my profile. I, I can change my password. I can see the organizational uh, details and change them and edit them. Uh, I can also invite uh, users with specific roles in this dashboard. And that's all. Um, from uh, from this uh, presentation, should you have any comment, question, whatever you need to say, uh, please uh, you are welcome to to do. Yeah, tell us. I think, I think we might leave questions until the end. Um, uh, just see what time we have left towards the end. So I'm just if anyone has any questions, just make note of them and, and we'll circle back to that um, towards the end. If that's OK, just so that we know what time we've left. Um, OK, next up we have uh, Filippo, who's going to give us uh, uh, an overall description of LightSource Labs uh, as the energy pilot in CyberSane, the, the, the solar energy management platform that they have there. I think, Filippo, then you're going to roll straight into the pilot execution then. So, um, where you go. Yeah, thank you, dear Mut. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today at this demo 
uh, of CyberSane. My name is Filippo Bellini and I work as a validation software validation engineer at LightSearch and I'm one of the responsible for the quality of the software that runs on our product. So I hope you can all see the, my screen and I'm going through yep. a um, brief description of the uh, infrastructure um, that will be used for, the, for demoing the use case scenario today. So first of all, what's the goal of the pilot today, right? So the CyberSane Energy Pilot focuses on the assessment, detection and elimination of potential threats issued against an energy management system product developed by LightSource Labs and called Tribe Hub. What is Tribe? So Tribe is basically a community of users, smart energy users, who utilizes our product, Hub, uh, and an intelligent app to optimize energy flows within a domestic uh, or industrial environment. Just to reiterate the message that Dirmud uh, gave you at the beginning of this um, event. So the hub and the app work in harmony to ensure the use of the solar energy generated by the solar panel is maximized while also taking advantage of low cost electricity available from the grid. The hub optimizes your home major energy loads like the battery system, the electronic vehicle charge point, your air conditioning unit. It just makes sure that they are always operating when energy is cheapest, when is the best moment for you to use them. At the core of all this product, there is the an IoT gateway, gateway, an advanced intelligent IoT gateway that we call the hub and is the one in the picture uh, on the right. So this gateway is designed to monitor, control, optimize and automate energy flows within a house, effectively turning it into a smart home. A typical tribe installation then uh, comprises of this component, the hub, that sits in between energy sources like the power grid, the batteries, the solar panels and the household appliances that are using the energy. Domestic appliances can be connected to the tribe via an IoT smart devices like wireless energy metered power plugs. So all the information about the consumption, the energy consumption of all the appliances are transmitted to the Gateway Hub. And there they have been stored, analyzed and transmitted to the cloud. So the data collected by the hub can be monitored by the end user in real time, thanks to the app that I was talking to you about before. And the data is also transmitted to a store uh, and stored in a cloud-based infrastructure called the broker, using of course an encrypted communication protocol. So the data is constantly available in both sides, uh, at live at the, uh, the house where the, <clears throat> the, applause in, the appliances are providing the, the metering and, um, and the information and um, in the cloud uh, on our servers. To demonstrate the value of CyberSync platform in different scenarios here involving attacks to the Tribe Energy Management System, uh, we had worked with our partners to develop a few tools uh, that have been used to perform and detect the attacks. So, uh, as for Atos, we have the Suricata and the XLCMs tool that have been installed on the Tribe Hub gateway and on the broker to detect intrusions and anomaly communications from and to the gateway and the broker. We have the fourth encrypted traffic analysis tool installed on the Tribe broker to detect attacks pattern direct towards the broker itself. And then, of course, we have the CyberSim platform with all its component, LiveNet, HybridNet, ShareNet, DarkNet and PrivacyNet. This is a very high level description of the components uh, involved. As you can see on the, on the left picture, we have under this umbrella of a Wi-Fi domestic network, we have the Tribe Hub ga gateway uh, that is also connected via Wi-Fi with a, a, an energy meter IoT device, could be an appliance, could be whatever, an electric vehicle or all of them together. 
and on the Tribop gateway, uh, the Suricata tool is installed. The gateway communicates through the MQTT protocol via internet with the Tribe broker. And the Tribe broker is somehow protected or monitored as the, the, the best word by two other tools that are the encrypted traffic analysis by, by Forth and the XLCM by Atos. They both report on LiveNet and HybridNet to the CyberSane, CyberSane uh, dashboard. As for the specific uh, infrastructures component that relates to the um, LightSource product, to implement the use case attack scenarios, we have deployed and registered as assets into the CyberSane platform uh, energy devices providing energy readings. So, for example, a TP Link plug connected to a load. Uh, the Tribe Hub Edge Gateway, gathering devices info and sending them to the cloud, and the cloud broker uh, that comprises of many different microservices, independent microservices. So we have the MQTT service, that is the data exchange protocol used by the gateway to communicate the data to the broker and vice versa. A RESTful API service that provides entry point for all the services provided by our software, <clears throat> both on the gateway and on the cloud. A relational database that stores the configuration of each gateway. And a time series database that stores the data, the data collected by the, all the different gateways and stored both on the gateways themselves and on the cloud. And then, of course, there is also a graphical interface system for the uh, broker. Here you can see uh, again at very high level a simplified data flow involving the tribe components. So starting from the left, we have the tribe hub, the IoT edge gateway that is connected with energy meters, sensors, and uh, stores the data into the database and also transmits them through the internet into the UbiWorks broker infrastructure that comprises of different uh, services, uh, each one hosted in different um, virtual machine uh, shielded by load balancers. So we have the MQTT protocol uh, and we have the HTTP that protects the RESTful API, VMs, the cluster for the HisDB time series database that contains all the samples collected by uh, the different gateways and a configuration database that that contains a duplicate version of all the configuration for the different gateways that are deployed uh, in the fields. So this ends the description of the high level uh, infrastructure of the pilots. Um, now, the attack scenarios that we're going to uh, demo and present uh, regards three main specific uh, parts of the infrastructure, of course. The first one that we're going to uh, explore is the uh, possibility of an attack run to gain access of the compute capabilities of a gateway. And the second one would be an attack run on the, the broker itself to try to gain access to all the data stored in the cloud. And the third one would be uh, an attack run in order to simulate uh, a man in the middle attack whereby someone is trying to provide the gateway with fake data so to for example um, to mimic a lower consumption of energy than the real one. Now for um, timing purpose and also we, um, for um, the, um, the best results in the uh, demonstration we have decided that the, the first and the second uh, use cases will be the most um, presented, while the third one will be uh, kept at a very high level description without implementing it uh, in real time today. So let's proceed with the first uh, use case scenario where an attacker wants to gather uh, an unprivileged, wants to gain an unprivileged access to a tribe hub gateway. So the attacker wants to uh, access the gateway to exploit its compute capabilities to do what? For example, to launch DDoS attacks or possibly to run crypto mining software. So the attacker will run an exploit against 
the hub to gain unauthorized access to it. The attacker gain access to the hub and install a malware that initiate a communication with another server, um, transmitting data or stealing, leaking information to that server. So then the Suricata and the uh, XLCM detect both the hub's public IP communicating with a known C2C server and a signature on, of an attack. So an incident is created in the hybrid net. The hybrid net reports an anomaly on CyberSafe platform for the tribe security expert to take adequate countermeasure. And at the moment, uh, I will uh, first ask our partner to give a description from the attacker point of view, and then we will go through the actual implementation of the use case. Um, I suppose you're muted. Yes. Hello, yes. morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Luis Ribeiro from PDMFC, and I'm here with you today to give you the doctor's perspective on, on, on this uh, pilot scenario. So if you hang with me for five minutes, I'm going to, especially on the last use case, which we'll, we'll describe more in a generic term, and, and we'll do this back and forward between me and the multiple other partners that are going to execute against this scenario. And so I'm going to give you the attacker's perspective, what an attacker would do. And this is a, a different way, not just from the research, but obviously considering what the adversary is executing is helpful to understand how to protect ourselves better. OK, so on the use case one that Filippo was just describing, the attacker has got physical access to the tribe gateway. It's in his home, so he has all the free time in the world to go and explore it, uh, play with it. And so after a while, he was able to identify an exploit that he can run on the gateway. This exploit uh, starts obviously by a chain of attacks to get to a shell with remote privileges. He first needs to understand the bootloader, understand how it loads code, how the code runs on that platform, and then how he can inject his own shell and with that shell to gain privileged um, access to the device. With that privileged access, he can then do all kinds of stuff. And basically, as long as he's creative, he has all of the time of the world to, to do the attacks. So what does he want to do? He wants to install some malware there to make the device remotely controllable. This will allow him to monetize that device either by lending it out to dark pools to provide distributed denial of service on demand or to crypto pools to mine those resources, CPU and GPU to mine coins and then sell them later on the open markets. So after he gets access to the device, he uploads whatever code he wants to run. And the point here is that that code to be useful for the internet at large needs to have connectivity to the world. And so he tries to make something standard and not something that's only his. And to profit for, from that gateway, he obviously needs that specific gateway to contact his command and control server that he has on the cloud. And currently we'll simulate one uh, that's very well known uh, and from uh, a past uh, attack, which was Cobalt Strike. Okay, this is it in terms of the attacker's perspective. So he really wants to get resources either to attack somebody else or to just make money out of the computing resources and the energy expended by the house. Cool. So um, I'll get back to Filippo. And while he shows you what's going on on the platform, we'll be doing the attacks on the background. Unfortunately, I'm not going to show you the attacks. This is not the purpose of, of this uh, meeting. But if you have any doubts, obviously, feel free to drop a message at the end and we can get through the gritty nitty details. Filippo, back to you. Now I think you're muted. Thank you very much, Luis. So as you might have now started to understand, everything starts from, uh, from the security expert perspective from some sort of notification that something is happening on one of the assets that have been registered on the CyberSense platform. And in fact, I have received a notification on my 
um, email and that leads me to log in into the CyberSend platform and have a look if something is going on. And in fact, I can go uh, through the anomaly detection where I can see that a number of events are happening, including, for example, an high severity um, anomaly, which is a Trojan. So going to the info of the attack, I can see when the attack uh, has been detected uh, and especially useful, uh, I can see a recommendation uh, on what to do with this attack. So the recommendation here is to check for a Trojan in the source IP. As you can see here, the info that can be provided uh, for every uh, detection are a great number of them. And one of the information includes, of course, the source IP of where the attack seems to be coming from. So I can then log in into uh, the source IP and try to look for traces of this malware. I already have opened here for simplicity three, uh, uh, three shells on the same uh, gateway. So I'm going to run the scripts to uh, detect um, any traces of this malware. Since the detection can happen very fast, I can see here that a malware is probably uh, being executed at the moment and uh, is communicating, mm. it's, it's doing its own activities. Malware is associated with a PID, a process ID that I can use to kill the process. <coughs> For example, 4106 and all the process Oh, sorry, no, that's the wrong one. The process ID is, yeah, it's 27202. Anyway, the point is that the first action that I have to take as a measure uh, is to stop the, um, the malware from keep going the attack. Then I can, as showed before, going back to the CyberSense platform, try to learn more about this malware by, for example, um, studying articles related to the specific threats uh, and search them for um, um, a specific date uh, range. And once I have learned the information that I think are relevant for me, I can go to the containment, containment eradication and recovery section where I can create a new strategy. A strategy that will contain the steps that I need to run in order to take care of this problem from a security expert perspective and keep track of the strategy either for myself for the future or for any security expert that belongs to the organization that might need to face a similar or even the same uh, scenario. So as shows before by uh, Thanos here, I can create a strategy giving the name malware eradication, a description that contains uh, the steps uh, that I'm going to take, and the involved assets, and uh, even a specific uh, anomaly detected. Once this is done, uh, um, as I showed you before, I have performed the uh, killing the process that was running the attack. And I will be, and I will be um, issuing uh, a ticket to run um, an over-the-air upgrade to that gateway to completely replace the operating system to restore the functionalities and be sure that any trace of the malware has been removed, so the gateway is safe again to be used by the owner. Or in the worst case scenario, I can either even go in, even further and replace the unit itself. Once all these inf um, actions have been taken, I can move to the post incident activity uh, because I want to share with my partners um, information about the incident that I have just faced and have occurred. 
Now, of course, I don't want to share 100% the entirety of the information that I have at my disposal because they might contain sensitive data. So in order to um, be sure that I will be sharing only the information that I want to share, the first thing that I have to do is to go and create a data sharing agreement. Am I correct, uh, Alex? Yes, Filippo, you're totally correct. <laughs> so, uh, hello everyone, my name is Alexi, I'm from Sinar and I will explain uh, briefly what we can do with this data sharing agreement and uh, what we can define. So for every user for each organization, we have a specific DSA editor. As you can see, we, we can review the list of available DSAs and mainly we will focus on light source uh, BP CyberSane uh, DSA, which was created um, by Filippo and now we have an option to uh, review the DSA by clicking on the button show DSA and also we have an option to edit it. So let's review it and I will show and explain you what uh, particularly we have. So the DSA basically uh, is defined by the title and it has also the specific uh, ID. Uh, we can also define the validity of this DSA so that once it is expired, the data that we upload it or uh, we share it is not longer available for other users. And, and uh, with also um, with this DSA, we will define, we can define the uh, set or a list of parties that can use this data sharing agreement. It doesn't belong to the, uh, to the um, uh, list of parties or entities that can access the data. So basically, this data sharing agreement is coupled with this uh, lesson learned of the cyber thing. We do also have the policies, and, and this is the crucial part where we can define um, a number of authorization rules and the obligations. Uh, the authorization basically will allow to uh, specific uh, entities or users uh, to um, to access or to create data or to uh, use the functionality of export. The functionality export is used in order to uh, publish data, uh, publish lesson learned on the MIS pistons. And uh, we also have the obligation that basically communicates with the privacy net component in sorry for the in this case the share net component communicates with the privacy net. So once we have the request to enforce this obligation, uh, the share net component Component will uh, will call the privacy net in order to perform a particular operation on the uh, shared lesson learned, and uh, this obligation can be uh, either executed um, uh, before uh, sharing the data with the uh, with the MISP instance or at the moment when it is created um, on the cyber sane uh, part, and basically the. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, in fact, having the data sharing, sharing agreement in place, I can then decide that the lesson learned about a compromised gateway uh, where a Trojan has been installed on a device, exploiting the capability to run an attack, and all the information learned from this um, activity, I want to share them. So, once the lesson learned is create, I can then click to upload lesson. And I can select one or more than one DSA, the one that I consider to be the most appropriate uh, to share the information among the partner that I want uh, to give access to. And so once created, I can click upload. And as you can see, a new ID is created for this lesson learned to confirm that it has been shared successfully. And this uh, is the last step for the first um, for the first uh, use case scenario. I will then move on to present the second one, which, as you remember, now involves the uh, cloud uh, part of the infrastructure. 
So whereby here we have an attacker that wants to gain access to the broker infrastructure in order to, of course, have access and then steal sensitive information about customers, uh, all the information that are um, retrieved from the gateways and stored in our cloud uh, servers. So again, uh, here the attacker launches an attack against the IoT Tribe Broker MQTT service, so to the protocol that is used um, between the gateways and uh, the cloud instances of our services to exchange data, so to gain access into the system. Here, the fourth encrypted traffic analysis tool detects a suspicious signature of an attack in the TLS traffic towards the broker and sends an information to the live net component. The CyberSend platform received this notification of a new security incident with all the details about the incident. And, and of course, the, the CyberSend sends an alert to the security expert to take adequate countermeasures. So uh, like before, I'm gonna give um, the control of the, of the use case to our partner to give you more details about the, more insights about the attacker uh, point of view. Hi. Okay, so for this scenario, what has happened? The attacker went through the gateway and he sniffed the traffic, detected that it was communicating with an MQTT server. Then he tried to figure it out. How can he gather more information about the, that broker server? And he tries to do the scans, do the, some information gathering, and he finds out that it's vulnerable to a root force of user IDs and passwords. It needs then to be able to establish a connection to that service. For that connection to work, it was not able to do it directly, and so it tried many things. And after reading that the best security guidelines online, they say that for MQTT, you should enforce client certificate pinning, which means that since the connection is through SSL in this case, you need a certificate that's valid and accepted by the server so that you can establish a connection. This is a very good security measure. But since he has access to the device, he can do whatever he wants. So he spent a lot of time and he actually found out where were the certificates that the gateway was using to communicate with the broker. So he found out the certificates, but the, the password and the user uh, were properly secured and it remained elusive. So the option that he got on the table was, OK, I got the way to connect there. I know it's vulnerable to this type of attack, so I'll try to do a brute force. And so he exploited the fact that normally MQTT brokers assigned IDs to the clients. Every client needs to have its own ID. These IDs are by ease of configuration, by default set up incrementally. So you get to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so. And so his idea was, okay, let's start with one and I'll try to brute force uh, everything and, and see if I find, if I don't find for the one, I'll go for the two, three, four, and directly try to brute force like that. So to be able to brute force, he needs then to generate a list of passwords that he's going to try. And this normally comes from many places, either from the multiple leaks online, from um, sites that have been exploited in the past. So he can, he can use the most common passwords. He can generate his own rules if he has um, some idea of what the password might be, and it can be perfectly targeted to this situation. So finally, if the credentials are successful, then he needs to up his game. And then now he needs to perform an actual attack on, on the gateway beyond the, just the initial brute force. So he wants to sniff all of the information that is being shared through all of the other devices on the network that's published to MQTT topics that that specific gateway has access to with the current account that is obviously being used. Then it will try to um, replace the user with the known hash, hash uh, pound key, which means that let's subscribe to all of the topics and essentially try to bypass any access control lists that are defined on the server. And finally, 
If he succeeds, then he knows that he can inject fake data into the server. And so obviously this would be very helpful for him to try to reduce the, the energy bills. And if it was successful, it would help him create uh, a tool that he could sell on the black market to reduce uh, the energy bills uh, at large. Okay, so back to Eva to perform the attack and show you a bit uh, what is going on on this use case. Great, super. Thank you, Luis for uh, sharing the attacker's perspective. Let me first introduce myself. I'm Eva Papadogianaki from Forth, and today I will present you our Encrypt Traffic Analysis tool, which is um, part of the CyberSaint platform. So you must now be able to see my screen. Is that correct? Yes, Eva, we can now see your screen. Super. So as Luis said, the attacker already um, has access to the IoT gateway. Um, he or she knows the IP address of the MQTT broker. Uh, we already know the port that is publicly known, that is um, the port assigned to the secure MQTT service. Uh, the attacker knows the certificate, so the, atta the attack uh, starts here in the left terminal. So uh, on the right ter terminal, um, this is where we are logged into the MQTT server, and this is where the Encrypt Traffic Analysis tool runs. So while we are allowing some time for the tool to collect some initial network flows, uh, I will briefly describe you how it works. Um, since the incoming network traffic is encrypted with the TLS protocol, Packet payloads, if inspected, of course, won't offer valuable information. So, for Encrypt Traffic Analysis tool, searches for sequences of packet payload sizes, which are packet metadata that can reveal the nature of the traffic. So, the signatures are, are now expressed uh, with these sequences, and if a single network flow contains a specific uh, signature, then we have an alert posted to LiveNet. And here, as a matter of, of fact, we can see that uh, we have several, several alerts coming from this IP address, which is the public IP address of the IoT gateway. And uh, it um, informs us that we have a MQTT SA password brute force attempt. So if we go now to the, to the CyberSaint platform, we must be able to see uh, those alerts and yes we can see those and uh, let me describe you a bit about these alerts um, as I said this is the description of the signature that triggered the alert this is the severity which is medium the time step and the name of the tool if we go to view some information about this alert we can see that we um, that this is the private IP of the attacked server. This Eva, is the port. I stop you, but okay, this, the screen was frozen. Continue. Now, can yeah. you see? Now it's okay. Good. So um, this is the time zone. Yeah, and here. Um, this is the name of the tool, of course, and some information about uh, the signature that triggered the alert. The alarm. So um, here we can see the source IP address of uh, the attacker, actually, and this is the public IP address. These are the ports. And by now, I think uh, Filippo must have uh, received some emails regarding these alerts. Am I correct? Okay, so I will stop the screen sharing. Okay. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Thank you. So just to continue from where uh, Eva um, has stopped. So again, the idea from a security expert perspective is that I'm receiving a notification that leads me to connect to the CyberSame platform to investigate what's going on and why I got that notification. In this specific case, 
the notification talks about a security incident that is an MQTT brute force attempt. So obviously I can, as Eva already showed you, go through the, uh, all the information about the, um, the specific uh, security incidents that has occurred. And here, um, what I would probably do again would be to uh, go and learn more about um, this kind of attacks, for example, exploiting using the threat intelligence and typing concept again as a brute force. And once I got enough uh, knowledge, I can create a containment and recovery strategy. In this specific case, for this kind of attack, probably the best thing to do would be to log in into the um, the machine that is being currently under attack and issuing a ticket uh, for the network expert in order to uh, create a new rule, firewall rule, to block the attack so that the attacker cannot try to keep brute forcing um, and guessing the, the passwords to access the service. So once again, um, to create a new strategy, the process is the same by giving a name. In this case, it was brute force attack to the MQTT broker. And the description is a brute force scanning is performed from a specific external IP to the MQTT broker. Use firewall rule to block the attack. So this strategy will be now stored here for future reference, either for the, myself as a security expert or any other security expert within the organization. And once the uh, manas has been uh, eradicated, I will then again go through the post-incident activity where I want to create a new lesson learned that in this case uh, can be um, filled up with details like the assets involved, like the MQTT broker, the specific security incident that has been just recently uh, deactivated, de detected and deactivated it was the MQTT brute, uh, brute force attempt and many other informations. And once I'm happy enough with the content of it, I can of course upload it following a specific uh, data sharing agreement as shown before. So this will ensure that the data that I'm going to share across multiple organizations will be anonymized, will be uh, polished by all the uh, sensitive data that I don't want to disclose, but they are not, and that they are not also really fundamental in order to gain any advantage uh, from the knowledge of the attack itself. So once the, the lesson learned is uploaded, we get the message, we get a new ID, and the and this concludes the second uh, use case scenario that involved an attack performed towards the broker. The third and last attack is the one that uh, will be just um, um, exposed briefly at a high level. Uh, because is the one that involves um, a man in the middle attack whereby someone, the attacker, wants to uh, send um, wrong fake information into the gateway. So to basically notify the gateway that um, a lower energy uh, is, um, is currently consumed by all or a specific appliance in the, um, in the house. Of course, the most direct effect of this kind of uh, exploit would be for the uh, attacker to try to get a lower energy bill. Uh, so the cyber attacker wants to fool the system into recording inaccurate energy readings. So the first thing that the attacker will do will be obviously to try to alter the communications uh, between the tribe hub and the specific uh, device. So the attacker has obviously access to the local network and because it's inside or just the, in the premises of the house and he uses a man in the middle style attack to block the mass messages 
coming into the hub from the original uh, meter device and pushes inaccurate readings from the cloned energy meter instead. Obviously, the anomaly is detected and reported by the agent on the, uh, on the tribe hub that detects it and sends a notification uh, to the hybrid net that opens an incident following the same pattern that we have seen because the notifi a notification is sent uh, through either an email and inside the CyberSense platform and the security expert can detect, uh, can, can follow up uh, with an investigation on what happened and take adequate measure to assess the status of the system and stop the threat. In this specific case, stopping the threat would probably means to log in in our uh, broker and connect to the specific gateway where we can uh, identify the load that is has been acting, let's say, uh, in, a, in, a, in a weird way and possibly simply remove it from the list of the, um, of the devices and then sending uh, an engineer on site to take, um, to replace the device or to verify uh, that the, the attacker has been removed. Now for a specific uh, point of view uh, from the attacker side, I will ask again, one of our partners to give us more details about how this kind of money in the middle attacks can be performed. Okay, back to me. So in this attack, um, we'll go into the high level way of what the attacker is thinking, and then uh, we'll, we'll describe the step-by-step -step way that you would approach such an attack. So obviously we start with the attacker already has physical access to the gateway. And then what will he do with that physical access? He will use it to sniff all of the traffic that that gateway is generating, and it will locate that he has some communications with a smart energy meter, meter that's sending the energy readings uh, from the energy in the house. He will try then to block this legitimate traffic so that he can replace it with uh, his own device. He will reverse engineer the protocol that he detected on the network. This is uh, essential so that he can generate a new uh, fake attacker. He will code a simulator or e even um, create a new VM or on, on, on a, another machine that will simulate the communication. So, but this step follows the reverse engineering of the protocol that he detected. And then he uses that simulator uh, to create a new energy meter and replaying the metrics that he wants to do, that he wants to share into, into the system, the fake metrics, something that he got from the SNIF protocol. Okay, step by step. First, obviously, he gains physical access. This is the most important thing. From here, he has all of the time of the world to, to think about the attack. Then he needs to get elevated um, privileges. There are normally many exploits out there for zero days for exploiting Linux kernels and Windows. It, it's common knowledge. So if you have enough time, you'll be able to get an elevated uh, root account. Even if you can change the bootloader, even easier it is. Obviously, then sniffs the traffic to identify which protocol. You will then need to reverse engineer uh, the communication between the gateway and the smart meters, code, a dark meter simulator that will fake the readings and, and will simulate a new uh, legitimate device. For this, you will need to know the previous device IDs, the MAC addresses. The more perfect the simulation is, the harder it will be to detect that there is something wrong going on with that gateway. You will then need to safely block uh, whatever traffic it came from the real device so that you can then run the dark meter and uh, spoof the traffic uh, the metrics and try to reduce the the bills and finally you can profit out of that you can make uh, an application that you can sell for other owners of the same smart meter where they can reduce the energy bills and this is the way that um, an attacker is money driven that they will think about uh, doing this back to you filippo Thank you very much. So this in fact concludes uh, the third 
uh, use case scenarios of the attacks. And again, as mentioned before, if you have any questions, please take note of them and we will have the, um, the question time uh, towards the end of this meeting. Uh, back to you, Dirmit. Thank you very much. Yeah, no, I think that actually does bring us to the end. We're we're slightly ahead of schedule. Um, so if there are any questions, feedbacks, even any internal discussions between project partners, um, I suppose now is the time to ask them. Radio silence. I'll, I'll happily fill it in, not just because I always feel awkward when there's silences in meetings, but no, really, if, if anyone has any questions, I know we do have some um, external attendees. We have some project partners that may not necessarily be involved in work package eight or nine. Um, so, you know, all the experts are here. They're on hand. So if there's any questions, you know, feel free to post them up. Filippo, I suppose I, I, I'll, I'll start. Um, I, I have a question here put aside. Sure. Um, just in terms of light source, do you think going forward beyond the project itself that this is something that, you know, um, we're going to find very useful in light source? And are, are we potentially a customer? Um, I know we, we'd have to review it internally in that, but potentially would we be a customer for any, you know, final project product uh, developed by CyberSync? I think I can answer to this question from a very interesting perspective uh, because as I mentioned at the beginning, I am not actually a security expert uh, with this uh, title meaning someone that has performed a specific study on cybersecurity. Um, and myself, so not, not being an expert, have found the, um, the CyberSense platform, as complex as it is, because it is a complex tool, it's very rich of feature, but I found it very clear for someone like me that is not necessarily uh, an expert um, to take advantage of it. Of course, the, I just scratched the very surface of it, but yeah. even that part was, in my opinion, uh, in, interesting, especially uh, one of the features that I found intriguing was the fact that um, the platform is capable to create different attack scenarios as uh, demoed by Thanos. Uh, so I imagine providing invaluable information and insights to an actual security expert to predict uh, the, the, the kind of attacks that can be performed in order to access the different uh, acts, uh, the different assets of uh, an organization and hence put in place adequate countermeasure and protection. So I think that for an organization that has valuable data, especially on the cloud, like everyone does more or less this day, this could be a very good product. Yeah, and I suppose it is very in vogue in terms of, you know, light source we're here and we're the energy pilot. But in terms of Ireland over the last 18 months, there's there's been a cyber attack on her national health service. We call it the, the HSE in Ireland, which shut down a lot of their opera operating procedures, all of their online stuff. And even more recently, the National University of Ireland here in Galway, um, it didn't get that far. It was, it was I suppose, a, a lightweight version of CyberSane or something, but they detected a uh, potential malware attack, I think it was, uh, on the university, and they were able to shut down all the systems before um, anything got into the system. So it, it is a very hot topic at the minute. Yeah, um, indeed. Okay, I mean, that, that brings us up to um, to 11.30 here in Ireland and 12.30, uh, I suppose, for some of our European partners. Um, that's it. Uh, unless there's any further questions, I, I, I'll stop the recording and, and we can finish up. But just to say that, you know, if anyone does have, have any um, questions, you know, over the next couple of days uh, or even weeks, you know, all, all our information, you, you can contact CyberSane through Twitter or through our website um, and you can post the questions there and we'll get back to you. Um, OK, if there's nothing else, then I, I think I'd like to thank everyone today, all the speakers, um, Jorge, Thanos, Filippo, everyone involved in the pilot execution. Um, so, yeah, thanks very much. And any questions, you feel free to post them on and we'll get back to you. If I may just jump in very quickly before uh, we sure. end here. 
I'm adding to the chat right now a CyberSane questionnaire that we hope if all our participants could please uh, fill it in to give their um, feedback on the, the platform itself, what they've seen today, as well as the uh, the pilot. That would be very, very much appreciated from our end. Sure. Yeah. Thanks, Edward. And thanks, everyone. Thank you.